What is the Shemitah? The Shemitah is an ancient mystery, it goes back over 3,000 years to Moses, Mount Sinai. Yet it is affecting everything from 9 11 to the rise and fall of the economy to the crashing of the stock market to the rise and fall of nations, everything from World War I, World War II, what is happening right now, and what will happen. It is the most precise, mind-boggling, biblical mystery, and it's coming true now. Now, when you talked about it in your book, The Harbinger, did you have any idea that this would, would so affect us today in our everyday life? I mean, and how big it is. I knew it, I knew it was uh, happening, I mean, at least in a certain period, but I had no idea that it, it, it didn't just happen then, it's been affecting us, every single one who's watching right now, it's affecting every life since the day we were born and the future. I had no idea until very recently how big it was. It's just, it's really mind blowing. Okay, let's just go start with basics. Yeah. What does the Shemitah mean? What does the word mean? The Shemitah l l means the release, but it can, or it could also mean, literally, it can also mean the fall or the collapse in Hebrew. It can also mean the shaking. And what it, what it is is this. In Mount Sinai, God gave this law to Israel. Every seventh year, you would have a Sabbath year, a year of rest. That rest was called the Shemitah. There was no sowing, no reaping of the land. And on the last day of the Shemitah, the, the day is called Elul 29 on the biblical calendar. On that last day, something unique happens. All credit is wiped away, all debt is wiped away. The financial accounts of the nation are wiped clean. Now, this was to be a blessing, but when Israel turned against God, the Shemitah comes back as a sign of judgment on a nation that is driving God out of its life. So this is where it affects us particularly today. So the thing is that the Shemitah affects, as you can see, the economy right away. It's, it, it's, today it would be a, a recession or a depression. I mean, and the, the, the Wall Street, it literally is the collapse of, the, of, of, of our financial realm. So what we're gonna see so is- So we're, we're gonna have a collapse that's not a blessing. We're gonna right. have the judgment type of collapse. We have already speaking. seen it happen and it's actually getting more specific the last two Shemitahs have been so exact, so precise since 9-11, and, and we're coming up to another one as well. You look at the last 40 years of our financial history, and you look for, there's five great turning points or long-term collapses combined often with recessions. When do they take place? I'll give you an example. 1973, first one. Second one, 1980. Third, 1987. Fourth, 2000. And fifth, 2007. Great recession. What do you notice about all of them? Every one of them is separated by a seven year period. The Shemitah gets to its peak. That's when 9-11 happens. 9-11 happens at the peak of the Shemitah, the last week when it's getting ready for the, the day of nullifying, wiping things out. And actually the, the collapse of the tower causes the collapse of Wall Street. You have the greatest, so you have the, the collapse of a tower, pride, I mean, the pride of a nation, and, and you have the collapse of Wall Street at the same time on the day of the Shemitah, which means that even the timing of 9-11 was determined, had to be determined exactly by the ancient mystery of the Shemitah. And what it, here's the prophetic things with this, Sid. This is just one of the things, that if the rise of a tower speaks of the rise of a nation, what does the fall of a tower speak of? It speak, it's a warning of the future of America. So I want you to tell me what you think is going to happen. I believe, whether it happens in this period or not, and I'd be ready, I believe without any question, a great shaking is coming to America. And the shaking will affect the economy, will affect the financial realm, well, uh, and can be very well more than either of those realms, but it will affect that. Something like a famine in the land. I believe uh, even services and infrastructure will, will stop. I think it's also appropriate to wish ourselves a happy new year given what I would like to talk to you about, which has to do with uh, the global economy and what we should expect for 2014. Now I'm going to test you um, numerology skills by asking you to think about the magic seven. Okay? Most of you will know that seven is quite a number in all sorts of themes, religions, and uh, I'm sure that you can compress numbers as well. So, if we think about 2014, all right, I'm, I'm just giving you 2014, you drop the zero, 14, two times seven.
and uh, I'm sure that you can compress numbers as well. So, if we think about 2014, all right, I'll, I'm just giving you 2014, you drop the zero, 14, two times seven. That's just by way of example, and we're going to carry on. So 2014 will be a milestone and hopefully a magic year in many respects. It will mark the 100th anniversary of the First World War back in 1914. It will mark the 70th anniversary, 70th anniversary? Drop the zero, seven. Of the Bretton Woods Conference that actually gave birth to the IMF. And it will be the 25th anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall. 25th. It will also mark the seventh anniversary of the financial market jitters that quickly turned into the greatest global economic calamity since the Great Depression. crisis still lingers. Yet, optimism is in the air. We've left the deep freeze behind us. Extreme cold is plunging oh, much of the nation into a deep freeze right now. From the Dakotas to New England and down into the deep south, that Arctic air is pushing temperatures to as much as 30 degrees below normal, forcing hundreds of schools to close today in Chicago, Minneapolis, and the Dakotas. The high in Minneapolis today expected to be, get this, minus four. So we're talking about record-shattering temperatures across a lot of the country. How cold is it, you ask? Here's a picture of Niagara Falls. Behind there somewhere, behind all that ice and snow, the falls are still roaring, but, but boy, you can't see them. They are encased in ice. It's amazing. It's an incredible picture. Beautiful yeah. picture. Meantime, that Siberian Express is, of course, our top story. If you are not waking up to record-shattering temperatures this morning, chances are you will by tomorrow. We've got this all covered from the deep south to that breathtaking scene at Niagara Falls. That's where today's Dylan Dreyer finds herself this morning. Hey, Dylan, good morning. Good morning, Savannah. You know, I wasn't quite cold enough in the United States, so I had to head up to Canada. But ironically, it's actually colder in parts of Kentucky than the minus three we're feeling right here. But we have been in such a prolonged period of below freezing temperatures that the great Niagara Falls is partially frozen over. Now, the falls themselves will never freeze completely because there's just too much rushing water. But it's so hard to show you cold. But we thought this certainly uh, could show yeah, you that cold. You can also see cold in Baltimore, Maryland, where uh, cars are literally frozen in place. The water has been splashing up off the roads and has been freezing on contact with this car. You can also see cold by the numbers, records that have stood for more than 50 years stand to fall today in places like Asheville, North Carolina, Nashville, Tennessee, and Paducah, Kentucky, where this morning it'll be even much colder than that. And in Boston, oh, Boston, this is already the second coldest February on record, on top of this being the second snowiest winter ever in that area. Now, several more records are likely to be broken today and tomorrow as this frigid air from the Siberian Express continues to take hold of the eastern United States. And here in Niagara Falls, this uh, does stand to be one of the coldest Februarys on record, which, of course, makes it look absolutely beautiful. The problem is you can't stand out here for too long to enjoy it. It's minus 3 here right now with a wind chill of minus 22. Willie? All right, Dylan Dreyer at Niagara Falls. Tennessee is under a state of emergency this morning. In the past week, there have been 22 weather-related deaths. Nine of them are blamed on hypothermia. Anna Warner is in Monterey, Tennessee, about 90 miles east of Nashville. Anna, good morning. Well, good morning. You can see the damage that ice has done in many parts here. Branches brought down by inch-thick ice in many cases, and power lines, too. At one point over the weekend, more than 50,000 people were without power here. Crews are working to turn on the lights and heat for thousands of Tennesseans after trees coated in thick ice buckled, taking power lines down with them. And the horizon looks just a bit brighter.
So my hope and my wish for 2014 is that after those seven miserable years, weak and fragile, we have seven strong years. Now, I don't know whether the G7 will have anything to do with it, or whether it will be the G20. I certainly hope that the IMF will have something to do with it. Uh, let's start with cyber. Yeah. You've said that a cyber 9-11 is not an if, but a when. What would a cyber 9-11 look like, and how soon could it happen? It could happen uh, imminently. Uh, what would it look like? It could take many forms, but uh, let me just give one that may come to mind, which is uh, what happens when the electric grid goes down. You know, we saw that during Sandy, and you see how that impacts everything from the ability to uh, heat uh, homes, to the ability to pump gasoline, to the ability to have lighting at night, everything. So uh, when we look at the nation's critical infrastructure and uh, where it is vulnerable, one of the vulnerabilities is through the cyber and the networked cyber world that we live in. Uh, so uh, we have been, you know, kind of trying to get this word out. Uh, the Secretary of Defense has, I have, the Attorney General has, the Chair of the Joint Chiefs has, saying, look, uh, we, we shouldn't wait till there is a 9-11 in the cyber world. There are things we can and should be doing right now uh, that, if not prevent, would mitigate the, the extent of damage that could be caused. Get ready for Grid X2, the grid security exercise. It's a multinational terror drill, and it's scheduled to take place in the coming months. Supposedly, it aims at assessing, testing, and validating vital infrastructure resources should they come under an unlikely cyber attack. It's scheduled for November in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. So get ready for martial law. They can put that in place right away. And remember, Janet Napolitano said earlier this year that it's not a matter of if, but when it happens. And it's already happened in Venezuela when it froze transportation, business, and overall communication in that area. In FEMA Region 3, they're preparing for something of a large magnitude, putting out bids for contractors, demanding delivery in under 48 hours. Now, these items include various things such as clothing, uh, 100,000 scrub pants and shirts, sweatshirts, 6 million cotton blankets all to be ordered by October 1st, 2013. And the Center for Disease Control ordered $11 million worth of antibiotic. The electrical grid is a network of power plants and transformers connected by miles and miles and miles of power lines carrying different amounts of voltage. In the United States, the grid is divided into three main smaller grids called interconnections. There's the Western Interconnection, the Eastern Interconnection, and the Texas Interconnection. Don't mess with our interconnection! Each interconnection is governed by either a single control center or a consortium of control centers that monitor and regulate the flow of electricity with thousands of sensors. for a multi-state training exercise this summer called Jade Helm 15. While the military says it's just training soldiers for the realities of war, critics say the Army is preparing for modern-day martial law. What's happening is between July and September, a bunch of Green Berets, Navy SEALs, and special ops from the Air Force and Marines are conducting some realistic training exercises across the Southwest. The military says these are vital skills when it comes to an ever-changing threat. But in the slideshow of the training exercise, it says Texas will be simulated hostile territory.
And heads up, residents of Broward, BSO, and other law enforcement agencies will be assisting the military as they conduct <coughs> training exercises in the skies over the next two weeks. So don't be alarmed if you see Black Hawk helicopters in the sky. These urban training drills will be similar to those conducted in Miami-Dade last month. My kids love seeing them flying over. John Boehner has just announced this. Pope Francis will visit Capitol Hill during his trip to the U.S. and will become the first pope to address a joint meeting of Congress on September 24th. As we've reported, in addition to Washington, the pope will also be making stops. His first stop will be in Philadelphia. He'll also go to New York City. This is an enormous, highly anticipated event, obviously. And in sharp contrast to that other visit, the joint meeting that Boehner uh, invited, of course, Prime Minister Netanyahu without first telling the White House or anyone else with the State Department. But this will be a very big deal indeed, September 24th on Capitol Hill.